Good morning, good afternoon, good whatever. Wherever you are, it's a great day. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're here to the Breaking Free Show. We're delighted to be here each and every week bringing you the most exciting shows, opportunities, just wonderful ideas, technologies, resources, and just information that we can possibly bring you. So hold on. We're going to share the show with you. I just want to say hi to Amnon. Hello, Marilyn. How are you? I'm good. And you? I'm fine. Good weekend? Um, yeah, the weekend was good. The kind of... Uh, we had, did, did you have hail? And you're, yeah, you are? night. One night, I think. Yeah, take a look outside on the roof of the shed. It's all holes. Yeah, it well, was it, it was bad. It, it sounded it was bad. Really bad. It sounded bad. But, and, but other beautiful. than that, beautiful, yeah. right? No, no. Beautiful com- weekend. My yep. daughter and her husband and two children moved in with us for a couple of weeks in a sixteen hundred square foot little town home. So it's uh, two babies and two adults. It's been it's wonderful. My yep. grandson it's, it's, every morning gets up and comes in and gives me a hug. So I am thrilled beyond measure. Okay, we're going to get on with our show. I'm so excited because this is going to be a very interesting show today. So please feel free anytime you want to call in at 919-518-9773, where you can join us in our chat and that you can put your name, nickname, whatever you like under our video. And you can certainly ask questions and comment in there as well. And you can also join us on Skype video a voice excuse me at computers that's plural then the number 2k voice and you can come in that way as well if you have a question a comment whatever you desire we'd love to have you join us so today my guest is sarah chrisman and you are going to be so fascinated when you hear sarah just sit back and and i'm telling you right now open your mouth because you're going to go like this (gasps) This is amazing, and it's amazing to listen to people like this who have something so incredible to share. So let me introduce you now to Sarah. Sarah, welcome to our show. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Good, good, good. So Sarah, tell everybody about you. Well, I'm an author. I write books. Uh, I've written both nonfiction and fiction. My current project is a series of historical fiction set in the 1880s and 90s. And it's about a group of friends in the Pacific Northwest. Here they are. <laughs> it's called The Tales of Chetsamoka. And Chetsamoka is a town based on the town where I live, which is Port Townsend, in Washington State. Washington is shaped, if you hold up your left hand uh, with a fist and your thumb crooked out, Washington state is shaped this way and I'm trying to get it centered in the video. There we go. (laughs) Washington state is shaped this way and Seattle is here. Port Townsend where I am is here right at the tip of the peninsula. So it's about as far Northwest as you can get in the continental United States without dropping off into the ocean. And that's where I live. And that's where the town in the stories is based off of. And I renamed it Chetsamoka because Port Townsend historically is named after an English aristocrat who never actually came here. (laughs) He never actually saw the place. It was uh, Captain Vancouver, who was an explorer who wanted to curry favor with his friends back in England who decided to name a lot of different places after his friends back in England. Um, Cause you know, he thought that would help him get, get funding basically for his ships. So he named a lot of places after friends back in England, including Port Townsend. But I wanted the town to have a name that was actually connected to the people who lived here. And Chetsamoka was the name of the chief of the local Klallam tribe. Now, the Klallam were the group of Aboriginal Americans who lived in this area, and they uh, allied with the U.S. government. It was still a territory, Washington was at that point. It was not yet a state. But in the 1850s and um, continued on from there, the Klallams uh, decided that the Americans who were coming in 
would be good good people to be friends with <laughs> because human beings being human beings whenever a lot of different groups of humans live in close proximity to each other there are going to be some that are friends and some that are enemies and the Clallams were friends they were allies with um, Chief Seattle's tribe that was one of the really big ones the Duwamish uh, and they were allies with a number of other tribes they also had enemies because they were human and uh, some of those enemies could be very dangerous there were some northern tribes especially that would come down here and they would raid tribes like the Clallams and they would kidnap people into slavery and take them north and so when the Americans came out here and they met the Clallams, the Clallams said, okay, these are some people who seem to have a rather powerful government behind them. They've got some big guns. They're friends with the tribes we're already friends with, so let's be friends with them too, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's what allowed a settlement to take place here. It's what allowed Port Townsend to develop was the fact that they had these friendships with the Clallam. It would have been much harder if the Clallam hadn't decided to help them. And Chief Chetsumoku was the leader of the Clallam. And that's why I renamed the town after him. And then the stories take place in the 1880s and 1890s. And they are when the town has moved past those early settlement days. And it's gone beyond just a settlement in the wilderness and it's more of a built up civilization. It's still a bit rough. It's not quite New York of the time. This is a time period by the 1880s. New York was, I mean, it was a big city. Mm. <laughs> they had multiple mail deliveries every day and omnibuses and the whole nine yards out here. Things were a little more primitive, but it wasn't quite as rough and tumble as it had been. And so the really fun thing about setting the books in the 1880s and 90s is that I get to showcase what a dynamic time the end of the Victorian era was. So uh, Sarah, so I just <laughs> want to mention to everyone that's listening, Sarah not doesn't just write about the Victorian time, but she lives it as well. So if you notice, she is a little darker, you know, than most of our guests would be because she's not sitting there with a bunch of bright lights. Just so you know that her setting is very different and the way mm -hmm. she writes. And there's so much to find out about, about the idiosyncrasies behind even how she writes. So you're going to hear some things today that are really fascinating. So Sarah, talk some about your, your lifestyle you know, that in, in how you write? Well, from the time I was a little girl, when I was a young child, I had two big dreams in life. I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to live in the Victorian era. And as I grew older, I eventually came to the realization that these two things could fit together. One of the axioms of writing is that writers should write what they know. And one of the corollaries to that is that to write about something, we should live it. And so everything in my house is something that is something that helps with my writing. And the way that my husband and I live and we've chosen to live is as close to it, it incorporates as many elements of Victorian life as it possibly can. We know better than anyone that true time travel is impossible, but the more we can bring into our life, the more we can learn from. So we use natural lights. Um, and when I say natural light, I mean windows, mm. <laughs> letting in the sunlight. <laughs> After dark, we have oil lamps and it changes the rhythm of life a lot. And when I write about, and it makes me realize that it, and pay attention to the time of day and the way thing, people do things. So, for example, there's a scene in my first book where someone needs light for a certain task. 
and his first automatic statement is uh, open the curtains. Now that might not occur to uh, a lot of modern people trying to write something they had no familiarity with, but to me it was just automatic that that's the way things go because that's how I live every day. And we have a wood burning cook stove and uh, an ice box. And I cook with a lot of period recipes from antique cookbooks from the late 1800s. And those recipes actually wind up in my books, which is pretty fun. So in the backs of the books, there are appendices mm -hmm. that tell where various information comes from. And they also include recipes from our antique books, a lot of which are recipes that we use quite often. And that is, it's a way to connect with the culture and with the time because food is a very intimate thing. And I really love being surrounded by lots of little details for all the senses, sight, touch, smell, taste, and sound. Being surrounded by those details and getting to share them with other people. And so when I write my books, I want to give people the opportunity to get a little window into a different, period in time. And by including the recipes, I want them to get a little more of that experience, not just the words, but the smells and tastes as well. And to invite them to explore things more fully themselves. And, it's, and that's all. And it's very true. I mean, I like what you just said about, you know, obviously writing what you know and, mm -hmm. and, but, and living it. Mm -hmm. really taking on that that lifestyle persona it makes it really i mean you you really then have an answer for a question that might come up even in your own imagination mm -hmm. to, to well and about. just from our own experiences yeah. Yeah. and if one looks at the word museum it's a very old word it we get it from the greeks and a museum in ancient Greece was literally a temple to the muses. It was a sacred space devoted to the goddesses of art and inspiration. And I think of our home very much, and especially my den, where I write, mm -hmm. I think of these spaces very much as museums in that sense, in the sense of being a space that's sacred to inspiration mm. and that we derive inspiration from. And that's a very important concept to me. And it's something that I'm always thinking of as I go about my daily life, that these are things that inspire us. Mm. And there was, um, there was an, a set of archeologists at one of the universities of California, I think, I think it was UC Berkeley, uh, who a few years ago wrote a book called Life at Home in the 21st Century. And in that book, they talked about how built spaces influence the people who move through them, the people who live in them. And I, I was very, actually very flattered when the author of that book, the professor from the the University of California agreed to uh, write a blurb for one of my nonfiction books. It was sort of a, oh, maybe <laughs> you'll do that for me. Thank you. Uh, because her book had been so interesting to me and so helpful because she discusses just the deep impact that the spaces we move through have on people. And most people don't even think about it. It's a subconscious thing. And yet it's a subconscious thing with a very deep influence. Well, subconscious, obviously, very deep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, our surroundings shape us. And not only is this something that was discussed in this academic work by a modern professor, but it is also something that the Victorians felt very strongly about. A lot of people 
And I think most people, when they see anything from the Victorian era, one of the first things they'll notice is most of it tends to be very, very pretty. Mm. It tends to be decorated. And that's by design. There's no accident about that. And it was because the Victorians very strongly felt that elevating surroundings, beautiful surroundings, have an elevating influence on the human soul. That the things that we move, the, the spaces we move through every day, the things we interact with every day, have an influence on us. And I think anybody who has visited a different country has probably noticed that, that cultures are influenced by the spaces they live in. There's, uh, I forget who it is who said geography is destiny, mm. but the spirit behind that is that the land we live in influences the lives we lead. Obviously, someone in the mountains is going to have a different daily life than someone living on the shore by a river. And so they have these influences on just our daily patterns, the way we do things, the way we see the world. And beyond just landscape and geography, the human built spaces also have an influence as well. And that is why the Victorians built spaces were the way they were. There, it was very, very well thought out. There was nothing accidental about any of it. Sarah, let me ask you. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot I want to ask you. I want to ask you about your writing process because I know that you actually write, mm -hmm. you know, and I and that's a, very important. But I I want to ask you how how valuable do you think it is that you we're born now in being able to reflect the Victorian age and understand it and explore it and express it so well in the things that you're saying for, you know, the, the mindfulness mm -hmm. of, of, you know, the, the decor or the jewelry or all the things that I'm attracted to and mm -hmm. how important all those, the details were. Uh, understanding the word mindfulness today Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a it's like it's it's a word of today but because mm -hmm. you're born now how valuable is it that you're born now to be able to understand the victorian age and be able to teach about it and, and to this degree mm -hmm. it's an interesting question and it has a lot of different facets to the answer because um there are different things involved for one thing, people tend not to notice the mundane. They tend not to notice the things that, well, the things that are most prevalent, the most um, present in our lives are the things that tend to get noticed least. Uh, people never write down in their, well, hardly ever, I'm sure, write down in their diary what they had for breakfast on a given morning, because mm -hmm. it's just automatic. It's just things that happen. And so people moving through a certain time, they don't consciously say to themselves, I am living in this time and I am doing all of these things because I am living in this time. Mm -hmm. I have a degree in cultural studies. And uh, when I went abroad, one of the, th actually, let me backtrack that a little. Before I even went abroad, when I was studying my very first French class, our teacher, our professor opened the class by saying French people do not say something in French because they mean it in English and don't know any better. French people say something in French because they mean it in French. <laughs> yeah. And it's true all different cultures. People don't say a certain thing a certain way just to, to pretend they say it because it's who they are. And because it's who they are, people very seldom step back and analyze that. It's 
as someone who has a degree in cultural studies, it's been really interesting to apply that to historical cultures. Because even when people are called out on the fact that they don't realize how much a part of their culture they are, even when they're called out on that, they still don't see it. So let me explain. There have been a lot of situations where people have criticized uh, something from history in a way that they would never, people would never look at country X and say everyone in country X is bad because everyone in country X is X, Y, Z. We've been trained to acknowledge that we shouldn't do that about other modern cultures, but people feel completely justified in saying that about historical cultures. Mm. Now, when I call them out on that and point out, okay, you're saying X, Y, Z, it's a very modern perspective on things. And they will automatically turn around and say, I am not saying it because I'm modern, I'm saying it because it's right. <laughs> which very much reminds me of when I lived in Japan and I had to confront something within myself and realize something that up until that point, as an American, I thought I knew how the world worked. I thought I understood the way the world was. And I lived in Japan for a year teaching. And in my time there, I came to understand that I had not been looking at the world the way the world absolutely was, mm -hmm. I had been looking at the world the way an American sees the world. Mm -hmm. And I think people never, people who haven't gone to another country, they haven't had the chance to, or haven't spent a significant time in another co country. They don't get the chance to step back and realize that they've been seeing things, that they are a product of their culture. And so to come back to your question, I think that being born now gives me more of an opportunity to step back and analyze things and step back and have that perspective mm -hmm. on things. Another aspect of it is I was born in the year 1980 and the 1980s. I'm, age, I'm aging myself now. I'm getting <laughs> to the age where I shouldn't say this, where I shouldn't. That's OK. My You're amongst friends here. Anymore. So, but the 1980s experienced a, um, what was called at the time, the Romantic Victorian Revival. So there were a lot of things that were seen as Victorian that were very fashionable, um, that were incorporated into a lot of fashion and home decor. And uh, just a lot of the Victorian beauty was brought to the fore. And so I grew up as a little girl seeing these things and seeing these things as in a very romantic way. Mm -hmm. And when I got old enough to start going deeper, it was a very fun thing to explore this culture that had always been very interesting to me, that had always been a symbol of beauty and refinement mm -hmm. and to delve deeper into it. My husband comes from a family that is very, they're a very academic family. His grandmother was a professor at the University of Massachusetts for over 30 years. And so his uh, automatic way of going about things is always to go to primary sources. So books and texts and um, things that were written at the time that come from the time. And that was, when I met him, that was sort of a new concept for me because I, I didn't come from a family that uh, has that historical perspective. My education was very much the K-12 American public school education, which um, mostly what we were reading was primary sources, or, sorry, secondary sources, were things written far after the fact. And so the idea that one could go back to the primary sources was sort of novel to me. 
And that was a, a lovely thing that Gabriel introduced me to. Uh, and the more I started reading things like diaries written in the 1800s, uh, the books and magazines that they would have been reading back then, the more I appreciated that this was a beautiful culture, mm. just like, <clears throat> not just like, but in the same way mm -hmm. that all the cultures I had studied as different modern cultures were beautiful cultures with very multifaceted uh, things to look at, you, historical cultures. Even like your it. names. You know, I, I, I'm taken aback by Sarah and Gab Gabrielle because I feel like they are, Victor they were, your names were born Victorian. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, mine <laughs> was because I was named after my grandmother and she was named after her aunt. Oh. And uh, so, interesting thing, my grandma was Alma Sarah. I'm Sarah Alma. And the name Alma is a really interesting one because <laughs> to Hispanic cultures, I believe, and someone might correct me on this, and I will apologize if I'm getting it wrong. I'm not of a Hispanic culture, and I, I apologize. I believe it is connected to the word soul oh. in, in Latin, but in Old English, it means song. And the name Alma was a name that existed in England before the Victorian era. It goes back very old, but it wasn't very popular. What made it very popular in the Victorian era was that there was a battle in the Crimean War that the British won big time. <laughs> they had a very striking victory, and it was on the Alma River, and it was the Battle of the Alma. Hmm. And so a lot of very patriotic British people, like my ancestors, uh, named young girls Alma, because this was something that was a symbol of Britain's success. And it was also, it had been a name that it, people had had. It just hadn't been popular, but then it became very popular. That's interesting. And I do want to tell you before, um, that uh, early on, I asked you if you knew Irish Suede, who's in our chat. And um, she says, it's Wendy. And she oh, wanted Wendy. to tell, yeah, she wanted to tell you she's I here know. and that she loves, she loves Sarah's books and she loves Sarah and misses her. Oh, I think so. <laughs> so just telling I'm you so that. I'm so glad you're enjoying all the books. Yeah. Um, so but they remind you of the time I gave you the tour. I, I once you, gave her a, a yeah. Chetsamoka tour. Of, oh, uh, what uh, kind of Tom. tour? Say that word again. Chetsamoka. Okay. Okay. It's the, yeah. the city yeah. that I, I renamed Port Townsend Chetsamoka. Right, 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 right. Column right. And uh, I gave Wendy a tour of the town. So we, we went through and we saw all the different landmarks of all the places that show up in the stories. Cool. And that was really fun. I really enjoyed cool. doing that for her. Well, she's here and she's love it and loving you. So that's wonderful. Uh, yeah. uh, Nyla on our chat is asking what your main source of, of information, resource was of information? Mm -hmm. Well, my main source of information is books. <laughs> many, many books. This room that I'm in now is lined with bookshelves. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the, the end of each of my novels, in the appendices, it goes I'm hold through. It up. Yeah. So, yeah, in, in the end, in the appendices, it goes through and it lists all the different sources that led to different scenes in the book. So it's like a bibliography, but it's in a fiction book. So I'm going to share, like, this is the first yeah. book, right? Uh, that's the third I mean, book. I have them in, oh, I had them in order. Okay, yeah. so the, fir the first one was which one? The first one is First Wheel in Town. Okay, got that's that one. one. First yeah. Wheel in Town. Here we uh -huh. go. And we have a PowerPoint, too. We want to show some oh, things. Oh, nice. Yeah. So here is this one. Can they see it? Okay. And then the next one was which one? Next one is Love Will Find a Wheel. Here we got it. I'm in. Uh -huh. There we go. Yes. And and then the next one is a wrapping at, at the, the door. door. Got that one in order. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then delivery delayed. Delivery delayed. Got it. Uh -huh. Right here. These are beautiful books. 
thank you. Just, well, they are. They're beautiful. And the, the graphics are lovely. Yeah. And, that and, picture on the front of Delivery Delay, yeah. that's actually Port Townsend. Oh, is From it? a magazine from the 1870s. Uh, we collect antique books that I and magazines that I use in my research. Uh, like I said, that's my primary primary form of research is these antique books and magazines. And so this is a picture that was originally black and white in the antique magazine. Oh, cool. And I scanned it in and colored it by hand. But this is Port Townsend. It's the town of Port Townsend. So it's the, the city. So, tell me something. When you define the age of uh, I mean, romanticism and being romantic, and it's the time of being romantic, what does that really mean? Well, it means different things to different people. Uh, the, the romance of the Victorian era, it was a time when people understood that men and women have different strengths. Mm -hmm. That's a rather iconoclastic thing to say these days. It's rather a firebrand topic. Right. But if we take any two given people, whether it's a man and a woman or whether it's two men or two women, as human beings, they're going to have different strengths and different weaknesses. And in the Victorian era, they recognized that there are some things, and again, this is something that's rather a firebrand to talk about these days, but they recognized that women are better at certain things than men, and correspondingly, men are better at certain things than women. And the idea was that instead of battling and being at loggerheads about those things, we should let our strengths and weaknesses complement each other. Mm -hmm. And the, the whole idea of a partnership is to make up for what the other one lacks, to help each other. And I think that led to better relationships back then, I really do, because they weren't seen as competition, they were seen as collaboration. And I think that's very important. It seems in power. It seems when I read some, uh, you know, some things on your website and it seems empowering to me to, Absolutely. to value the strength in each other and mm -hmm. and use each other as advisors. I, I, I love the fact that you, what you write mm -hmm. every day or whatever you do every day, you write and then your husband reads it. Mm -hmm. And then you Absolutely. right, and you value what he tell what he suggests or shares, and I mean mm -hmm. that's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. He's my he's my uh, automatic editor every night over supper. He reads what I've read that day, and uh, he reads what I've read. He he reads what I've written uh -huh. that day, and he gives me advice on what he thinks of it, and we discuss it, and it's very useful to and very helpful to have a male perspective, especially when I'm writing male characters, because I can imagine mm -hmm. what a ma man might say in a certain circumstance, but I'm not a man. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to have him tell me, well, what Jacob says in this scene, I think I might say it this way, or what Doc does here it might be better to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And of course, the female characters, I am a female, so I, those are easier for me. But the interactions, right. also we get to discuss and talk about how things would go. It was especially very helpful when I was writing a scene in the second book, when Love Will Find a Wheel, when two of the characters meet and Jacob has to... Addie has sprained her ankle and Jacob has to carry her up to some place where the nurse can nurse McCoy can look at her. And I really didn't have any idea what a man would be thinking when he's just met this beautiful woman for the first time. And he is really attracted to her, but he doesn't want to embarrass himself. <laughs> and it, a nurse has just asked him to pick up this beautiful woman and carry her somewhere. <laughs> I had no idea really how exactly that would play out in a man's mind. I knew those very rough things about it, um, the basics, but it was very helpful to talk to my husband and ask, okay, 
So these are the basics of what's going on. But what is he actually thinking? Mm -hmm. What is the actual thought process in his head? And Gabriel was able to give me advice and able to say things. Well, like, first of all, he's wondering where to put his hands and knowing that he shouldn't put them where he wants to put them. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting because you you do write in detail. Oh, yeah. And that oh, would yeah. be a very interesting. I mean, you couldn't mm -hmm. leave that piece out. Right. Exactly. Oh, exactly. How, that's it's, very cool. It, important. Yeah, yeah, real important. Yeah. Yeah, and, that's great. And yeah, I just love having Gabriel available to to talk about all these things with. Mm -hmm. And I think that working together on my books really helps our relationship as a couple too. And it's a very important aspect of that. Mm -hmm. And every single thing in this house is something that we've given each other as an expression of our love for each other. And mm -hmm. so not only are they ways we express our love for each other, but uh, they are also these artifacts that help with my writing. They help inspire both of us. They are part of the temple to the muses that I talked about before. Right. It is a lot of, there are a lot of very complicated things that go into this. It's not just one easy answer about anything. Do you, um, are there other, I mean, are there other people who live a Victorian life as it's you just do? Us. Just you. It's just us. But we're not, I've, I've never been, I've always been a little bit of a recluse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've always been someone who, uh, my books were always my best friends when I was growing up. Uh, and that's just how I've always been. Mm -hmm. And we're not people who require a huge crowd. We have a few friends. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Wendy. We have a few friends who are very precious to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not the sort of people that require huge crowds or parties. It's just not who we are. We're not comfortable in crowds. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. We don't need a whole, people ask, well, is there a community? And we say, well, we don't need it. We don't need other people doing the same thing to justify what we want to do with our own lives and what we choose to do with our own lives. It doesn't have to be something other people choose. We don't expect other people to choose the same things. Um, we just... You just do your thing. It, we just do our thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you, and you, I mean, you, how much of that uh, empowerment, that 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 love, that individuality, is is in your books? Would you? Oh, say? it's all in it's there. It's all in your it's books. It's all in there. That's what they're all about. That's what they're Absolutely. all about. They're they're about free will and choice and independence and also appreciating that no matter where you go or when you go people are people and there's going to be a great diversity of people in any place and any time and i try to showcase that uh, that diversity of different people there's a lot of different characters in the books and it starts by focusing on two in the first book and then as the series progresses, we get more and more characters. It, the, the stories are the stories of a cycling club. That's why we've got right. bikes and trikes on some of the covers. And by having it as a club, that means that I've got a, there's a group of friends there. And each friend has different things that they're interested in and different things that they focus on. And it also means they have different things they don't understand. So the readers get to learn about these things that might be unfamiliar with them by seeing them through the eyes of different characters. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that, they get to see, the readers get to see that 
all the beautiful diversity of people that we see today. Uh, some people are bookworms, some people are outgoing, some people are very interested in technical things, some people are fascinated by machinery, some people are more interested in human relationships, and there are characters in the stories that reflect all of those. And so the readers get to see all these different aspects of a very diverse culture and society mm. through these different eyes. It must take you a very long time, <clears throat> excuse me, to do the research and to it actually does. publish a book. It does. I bet and it part does. of what I do is um, down at the by my desk, I've got a a basket full of different mm -hmm. notebooks because I do write everything out by hand and I've got a basket full of different notebooks that I use to uh, just as an example yeah. so are you going to show us a basket <laughs> oh, look. I can it's a it's a big basket <laughs> well I I'm writing a series of books and each of my books oh. are about a different character yeah. let's say but and it's hard to keep it all straight yeah, it is. Yeah, but what I do is I have all these different notebooks that are each devoted to a different story. Uh huh. And at the back, I've got. So when I start writing the stories, I start them from from the front. But at the back, I turn it over, and in the back, I've got different notes of different things I've come across in my reading of antique books, antique magazines, 19th century diaries. Whenever I come across something in my reading that I think, oh, my character Sophie would say that, or mm -hmm. Nurse McCoy would say that, or this would fit in with Felix's story. Then I take the notebook that pertains to the story about that character, and I write down the quote or the citation, in the back of that notebook. Then when I get to that point in the series, when it's time to write that particular book, I start at the front of the no notebook writing the story, and then I've got all of those notes in the back to refer back to. It's a and great the, system. I'm sorry, what it's was a, that? It's a great system. <laughs> Thanks. It is a great system. Thanks. You're welcome. I like it. Yeah, it sounds and, great. It, it helps me keep everything straight. I've also got a little, <laughs> it's, it's virtual. It's not quite an address book, but it virtually is because uh -huh. it's, it's just a little book devoted to all the characters. So uh -huh. on each page I'll have, so I've got here, this is P Felix's page. So I've got Felix Spark Holloway. His nickname is Spark. Born 1861, Philadelphia, uh, Ken's chum six foot two inches rides a 58 inch wheel because in the the high wheels in the the ordinary bicycles with the front big wheel the the size is dependent on how tall the man is oh so goodness. i need to know that he rides a 58 inch wheel uh he's a racer he's a journalist lives in a tiny apartment building next to the newspaper office so it's uh came to chetsamoka in 1879 drinks his coffee black <laughs> so all of these details of the different characters I've got in my little right. sort of address That's... book so that I can keep them all straight and just know all the little details about them that I have to keep straight. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise, how would you do it? Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's impossible. Exactly. I, mean, I remember most of those things, of course, because these are my characters. These right. are my friends. Yeah. Um, but um, I do want to keep things really precise, like the date he came to the town, that sort of thing. That sort of thing would be easy to forget, but I, I've sure. got it all. Well, I have more questions for you, but before I do, we have some pictures that mm -hmm. I think would be beautiful to show. Sure. Because it would show, you know, and you can tell us what we're looking at. Okay, so that's the park near my house. So uh, that's Chetsamoka Park. And as I said, the, the town in my stories I renamed after Chief Chetsamoka, who was the leader of the, the Clallam tribe. And the park is named after him as well. And in the park, there, there's, a, there's a sign as one comes into the park that says, um, Chief Chetsamoka, friend of the pioneer. 
because this park was created at the turn of the 20th century. It was, he was, he had passed away by that point, but they made this very beautiful park as an homage to him. And the part where I'm sitting there now is right as you come into the park and behind that yew hedge, there's a very pretty lawn. And then there are steps going down to the beach because we are right at the, the top of Puget Sound here. So there's salt water nearby. And I go down to that park nearly every morning. And it's a, a very pretty place to go. It's only a few blocks from my house. I just love it. And there are also... I want to just say, yeah. Sarah makes all of her own clothes. Just remember uh -huh. that. When you're yeah. looking at these pictures and you happen to see Sarah, she mm -hmm. made all of that. Yeah. I base them off of antique clothes that we collect. I, I make my own patterns. And so what we're seeing now are pictures of Doc and Kitty, two of my characters. All of my characters in my stories are based, their physical appearances are based on antique photographs from the 19th century. And my husband and I together go through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, uh, I would probably say actually say thousands of antique photographs looking for just the right people to be the characters in my stories. And it's always a very special moment when we come across one and say, oh, that's Kitty or oh, that's Doc. So and the pictures, the pictures are in the books. Yeah, they are. Which is, they are. Yeah, because it's. I think that is brilliant because I've read books before that uh -huh. I always try to imagine what the person mm -hmm. would look like, like my favorite characters in the book. And I love the mm -hmm. fact that the pictures are in the book. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. really yeah. brilliant. Yeah. And I, I want to share that with people, just that yeah. glimpse into another time. Yeah. And so well, it gives that I, it gives that extra dimension. Yeah. You know, to and, the book. And with some of them, it's it's always really fun to just try to intuit the personalities mm -hmm. yeah. because there are the personalities that shine through in their photographs, even though they're very simple portrait photographs. There are still very subtle elements of their mm -hmm. personality that shine through. Right. Um, and also in some of, oh, there's me writing. <laughs> I write everything out by hand. I've got a fountain pen and I've also, uh, I, when I'm at my desk, I use my fountain pen when I'm at my, in my rocking chair or on my chaise long, I'm using a pencil so that I don't get ink all over my furniture. Um, but there've been some really interesting studies that the human brain actually works differently when writing things out by hand, as opposed to typing things into a computer. And it's actually a different part of the brain that's engaged when we're reading something in a book versus reading it on a screen. And I find it easier to write things out by hand. I find that my ideas flow better. I hope that it also uh, helps with the authenticity of the stories because I'm uh, engaging the part of my brain that would have been engaged back in the days when I was, when I'm writing about. I think people. with people and just knowing that about you, uh -huh. I think yeah. it even makes a difference with feeling the energy that mm -hmm. comes from yeah. the, the written I hope word. So. Yeah. I, I'm, I mean, I could, I'm, that's how I imagine it different than, yeah. you know, the typing it, but yeah, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of interesting because uh, every once in a while, I'll pick up a modern book just to see how things are going in the publishing world. And it's been very interesting seeing how a lot of the books that have come out recently, they're looking more, and even when it's a printed book, they're looking more and more like blog posts mm. <laughs> because people are accustomed, they're becoming accustomed to writing that way and reading that way. And that's not the direction I choose to go personally. And um, I prefer the older ways. It's, it's what I like. So, so when you make that distinction, 
And I can mm-hmm. see the blog post being, you know, kind of chop, you know, kind of mm-hmm. choppy in a way, right? Yeah. You know, um, w- you know, just with and with your writing, much more f- flowery and well, brilliant. Be- yeah. Kind of. Beyond that, it's also that there are ideas that are pre- the, the idea is presented mm-hmm. and it is explored in a very full way. Right. There are, uh, I don't want to say arguments because they're not belligerent like arguments, but um, just a statement or an idea is presented and then all of the different aspects of that idea are explored. Whereas in the blog post Mm -hmm. format, it tends to be what people refer to as TLDR, too long, didn't read. (laughs) So people try to just do bullet point statements without right. as much support as I like to use right. in my writing. Right. Right. I always like to support all the things that I say. And to me, that's important. Okay. And so that's part of what I mean when I say oh, that oh, I, yeah. I notice changes in the way people are writing things. That yes. I don't always agree with. Oh, yeah. the coasting cookies. Those are really fun. So the coasting cookies come up in most of the books in the series because they're a specialty of Kitty. Kitty is the character you saw in uh, one of the earlier photographs, the the lady with the pretty, pretty blonde hair. She bakes coasting cookies, which are a great favorite among all the friends in the series. Mm -hmm. And because she bakes these so often, all the books where Kitty is baking these cookies and sharing them out to all the friends, there are recipes. There's a recipe. For that, and the original recipe is from one of my antique cookbooks. I believe it's from the 1870s, and it's there in the books. And those two characters are Ken and Felix, who are always tussling over those cookies. They uh, are two two chums who are very good friends, and they they like to roughhouse a lot. So they're always tussling over the cookies. Uh, as if they were tussling over a football on a gridiron, basically. And those two bikes behind them, uh, they're both my husband's bikes. They're ordinary bicycles. And they are from the uh, one, the one with the red tire is an original. The other one is a replica. The original is from the 1880s, and that's an actual antique. Uh, the replica he rides more often just because it's not quite as fragile mm-hmm. as the antique. Gotcha. But uh, his experiences riding these bicycles have been very useful for me riding, writing the scenes where people are riding these bicycles mm-hmm. themselves. Because, again, I get to ask him, okay, what happens in situation a and what happens in situation B when you come to a hill? What are you going to do automatically? And so, when the characters come to a hill, they get to do what Gabriel explains he does on a hill. <laughs> so, before you, we go on with the next one, because before you know it, we're going to be out of time. Please tell everyone where they can find your books. Okay, they're and all about on your Amazon. website. Yes. Yeah, they're all on Amazon. If you ever happen to come to Fort Townsend, they're also in the gift shop out at Fort Warden, which is the uh, Fort Warden is a beautiful state park. Its main claim to fame is that it's where the movie An Officer and a Gentleman was filmed, <laughs> uh-huh. Richard Gere's movie. Uh-huh. But the gift shop has these books. But everyone else, you can get them on Amazon. Okay. And if you want uh, merchandise about the books, there's also um, well, I have a bag. canvas bags. Yeah, I have a bag here. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. So one of the one of the things in the stories is oh, there's my clock. See? Yes. <laughs> there we go. So one of the one of the things in the stories is that Jacob, one of the characters, has a bicycle and tricycle shop. So I thought it would be really fun to have an advertisement for his cycle shop mm-hmm. on uh, some canvas bags. And those are available on Zazzle. Okay. Perfect. 
All right. And then Sarah's website has lots of information. Mm -hmm. So that you, you know, in addition to her writing, you know, the books, you'll find other additional information that is really interesting to see. Mm -hmm. So we're almost out of town, out of town, out of time. So Mm -hmm. before we go, Sarah, just in summing up, what would you like to say about, you know, your books or a particular character or the theme, anything you want to say in summing up? Well, I think that if anyone is out there who has any interest at all in the Victorian era and the 19th century, I really hope that these books can give them a door to walk through to experience that world more fully than they may have done up until this point. Through the stories with the characters, through the recipes in the back, through the further resources in the backs of the books. I hope it just lets them, however briefly or for however long a time, I hope it lets them walk into a world that they've always wanted to visit. I used to, I think I must have, I I wanted to ask Sarah a question when we got started, but we've gotten into so many different things I never asked because I I used to, I think I used to dream about, you know, being in the Victorian, you know, era. And I wanted to ask Sarah if when she was younger, did she dream about it? So can you tell me really quick, did you used to dream that you were like living in it? Oh, like I said before, I had two big dreams when I was a little girl to live in the Victorian era and to be a writer. And now I get to do both. So when you said those were your dreams, was that like an awake dream or was that actually a sleep dream? Were you dreaming while you were sleeping? Both. I think that I think that our dreams when we're asleep are just different manifestations of the dreams we yearn for when we're awake. Right. Well, Sarah, you've been fabulous. Well, thank you. You Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for bringing us closer to an era that I think mystifies us in many ways. And thank you for, you know, sharing that, your life with us and in and, and doing that. Last week, we had a gentleman on who, who is a Mark Twain. I mean, he mm-hmm. came in looking like Mark Twain. And it was fascinating, all the things that he could teach us about Mark Twain. How fabulous is this? So this is great. But before you go, I just want to show you all. I have my books are up on Amazon as well. In just one afternoon, listening to the hearts of men. In just one afternoon, listening to the hearts of twins. And then my most recent one, in just one afternoon, listening to the hearts of millennials. I'm having my book launch on Sunday from 2 to 4 in Raleigh at the American Institute of Health and Fitness Conference Center. I will have a panel of millennials. Believe me, I am not the one that's sitting behind the desk signing books. I will have a panel of millennials to educate us about who millennials are, how they think, how they feel, their philosophy, how they live, and so forth. If you have any questions about it, please contact me at Marilyn at MarilynShannon.com. But it's at the American Institute of Health and Fitness this coming Sunday from 2 to 4. Sarah, you have been delightful. Uh, Well, thank you. Thank thank you. And I would... um, just say, I really appreciate it. Once again, thanks so much for being here and for sharing this with us. And thank you for, um, my, the opportunity that I've had to kind of, um, listen to this and going back and and really appreciating it and being more mindful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Yes. Thank you. And thank you all so much for being here with us today. We look forward to being here with you next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week and please love each other. Bye. Oh, and Sarah, don't go away. I'm not. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.